Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. The Aboriginal superstructure, as we call it at the Unshackled, as long cause division in Australia, which does little to actually improve the welfare of Aboriginal Australians and is more focused on symbolic measures and gaining itself more government and corporate funding. One of their catch cries is that uh, we, the white folk, are living on stolen land. Sovereignty was never ceded is the, the new slogan, including of NAIDOC week. The history of uh, uh, Aboriginal Australians' relationship with European settlers is complex, but overall it is a true statement that what uh, European settlement has, has done is overall improved the welfare of Aboriginal Australians who in ancient Australia were hunter gatherers gatherers. However, this fact of ancient Aboriginal Australian society was completely rewritten in Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, which since its publication in 2014 was embraced by Aboriginal activists, the ABC, uh, state government education departments who are having a talk to children and the federal Aboriginal affairs minister, Ken Wyatt. Dark Emu has now been exposed as one of the greatest literary hoaxes of the modern era with its historical fiction now being acknowledged by mainstream historians, uh, Peter Sutton and uh, Karen uh, Walsh in their written critique, Farmers or Hunter-Gatherers, the Dark Emu debate, which was published by Melbourne Unity University Press last month. But it took a lot of brave truth tellers and whistleblowers to expose the Dark Emu hoax. Uh, one of those is uh, Roger uh, Akaji, who is the founder of Exposing Dark Emu. Uh, he is my guest on tonight's show to talk about Dark Emu and its author, uh, Bruce Pascoe's Rise and Fall. Uh, Roger, welcome to Wilmsfront. Hello. How, how are you, Tim? And hello, viewers. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm not too bad. Uh, thank you. We're sort of, what is it? Uh, uh, th things uh, you're in in Melbourne, uh, such as myself, where we're both living under the the, the same regime. Uh, as I said, uh, what is that? Uh, lockdown light. So things are still pretty. I would say uh, not not good, but uh, not as awful as could be. Yeah, I think I think at least we can get around a bit. But um, the big worry is: is this the last lockdown, or is there more coming? So I think we're just mentally got to get used to another year or so probably of this. Yeah, uh, the, the, the next, what is it, incursion or, or, or mystery case, uh, we will probably brace ourselves again. But uh, let's uh, focus on what's what's your area of uh, ex expertise. Uh, you've uh, been one of the, uh, you, you would say, you would say a uh, frontline people who who's really uh, put uh, put their neck on the line to expose uh, Dark Emu and uh, Bruce Pascoe. You're not as well known as say somebody like uh, Andrew Bolt, but uh, you you've certainly achieved uh, a lot. But uh, we'll start because uh, not all of my audience will know exactly who Bruce Pascoe is. Uh, what Dark Emu is, uh, I'll start, we'll start there. So who is Bruce Pasco and uh, what is Dark Emu about? Um, well, Dark Emu is a book. I've got a, a copy here. It's just a book that uh, Bruce Pasco wrote in about 2014. I think he published it. <clears throat> and the story is he published it. And I think the, um, the publishing, he went, he says he went to quite a few publishers and no one accepted it. And the, the, the first, the only publisher or, you know, one of the ones that did accept it was Magabala Books in Western Australia. And they didn't think it would go that well. So they printed, I think, a, a first print run of about 800 copies in 2014. And so what's it now? 2021. So by 2021, it's, it's had a print run of Dark Emu and there's a junior version, Young Dark Emu. If you, what they're saying now, it's well over 300,000 copies, right, which for Australia is phenomenal. You know, if, you, if you're if you a well-known author and you sell 40 or 50 or 60,000 copies, you're doing well. So 300 is phenomenal. So um, 
if you assume they 300,000, maybe each copy is read by two or three, three people, right? So it's perhaps a million Australians that might have read it. So it's not, it's not overwhelmingly uh, the majority, but it's a lot of people, right? Um, so it did really, really well. And so what happened in about 200, 2016, it started to get a lot of awards. I think uh, Bruce Passo got the New South Wales Government Literary Award. Um, a lot of people came out of the woodwork and were promoting it on the ABC, at universities, um, at writers' festivals. So it got a lot of traction, right? And then this, the, the, how I came across it was I went to a friend's place in 2018 and she had it on her coffee table. So I just picked it up and I read it and because I like history. And I was actually fascinated because I because like a lot of people say, why wasn't I told? Why didn't why hadn't I heard about this history? Right, that Aboriginal people were farmers; they weren't just hunter gatherers. You know, I was I, I grew up in the sixties and seventies, so I, that's the education I got. And I said, this is incredible. So I read the whole book in one weekend. Right, um, and then I, then something sort of ticked. It sort of said, well, you know, how come we've had two hundred years of academics, uh, anthropologists. We spent hundreds of millions of dollars training people, and they've all come back and said it's Aboriginal societies were hunter-gatherer societies, right? Highly complex hunter-gatherer societies, but nevertheless, they weren't farmers. Um, whereas Bruce Pascoe said they lived in um, villages of a thousand people. They planted crops. They tilled the soil. They um, had stored grain. They lived in stone villages. So this is not the Australia I know. So then. I just sort of put through the book on, on the table and thought, oh, well, you know, it's okay if adults want to write these things. It's a free country. And then uh, probably about two months later, it was announced that it was that, that it was going to be put into school. So this book was being done, Young, Young Dark Emu, right? And then, then the sort of the penny dropped for me because then I could see it wasn't just a straight history book. It was, a, it was ideological. So... Um, I really got really upset because you, you can't indoctrinate our children, right? So if you if you write a book for an adult, an adult can do some critical research and go and study a few things. And if it's if it's rubbish, well, an adult can cope with that. But you can't teach an eight year old kid or a nine year old kid uh, something and expect them to do critical thinking because they don't think like that. If the teacher tells them that Aboriginal people were farmers and they lived in stone villages, the children will believe it. So then I got really angry. So I started um, doing a website. I just started my own website, and I started going through Pasco's book. And, and initially I found a few, few mistakes, but then I found some really bad mistakes where he'd actually manipulated the data. So he'd left out words. He'd put other words in. He twisted it all around. So it was, a lot of it was just made up, a total fabrication. And that, that's why we'd never heard about this before. So Bruce Pasco says he discovered this. So... Hundreds or thousands of people before him never discovered it, but Bruce goes into a secondhand bookshop, like he says, gets the journal of Thomas Mitchell, reads it, and then suddenly realises Aboriginal people were farmers. So it was all about manipulating. So that's when I started, right? Um, uh, so that, that's sort of how I got onto it, and I just started building from there. And Bruce Pascoe himself, he's I think he's probably in his 70s now, but... He's an Aussie like us. He grew up in Richmond. Um, I think he, I think he lived on King Island for a while. He was a writer of fiction. And then once we got into it, we found out the critical time for him was he'd been writing a lot of fiction. He's sort of okay as a writer, but never really made the big time. And then 1988, he wrote a book, and he had it reviewed by the Canberra Times, the newspaper. And the book was about a young man. Uh, finding out that he's actually Aboriginal, he was Indigenous. He didn't know, and the book's a, a fiction book about how he copes with finding out he's had he's got Aboriginality. And the reviewer, uh, I think her name was Veronica Sen, she wrote the book and she said, Bruce, you know, it's a really good book, but, you know, as we all know, uh, because you haven't had the lived experience of an Aboriginal man, you can't be that authentic, right? And all, an Aboriginal writer would be much more authentic, right? Now, it's only my opinion, it's only an allegation, but I think that he dropped for poor Bruce then. I think he realised that if he was going to have a big breakthrough and if he wanted to write, write about Indigenous items, Indigenous uh, books, it would be better if he was Indigenous. So he went off on a trek. He went looking through all the records and he says he found Aboriginal ancestry. And I think he was in his 40s, he said, and then from about his 40s on he found more and more 
elders said they knew his family, and then he, his persona developed from then. There. So he actually claimed Aboriginality to a few tribes and whatever, and that's where it started with him, right? So that's pretty much the background. So is that all right? Or not? Uh, when did you start the Dark Emu Exposed website? What year? So 2018 I started, right? And I, I think I was the first to start, but quite independently there was um, a writer, Peter, Peter O'Brien, he wrote, he wrote this book. This is his version. He started about the same time as me. We didn't know each other. So he started, I think, in 2018 too. So it, it clicked somewhere else. So 2018 was the time because it, it really started, once it gets into schools, we all notice, right, because we know people that got school kids or whatever, and that's when, that's when a lot of pushback came against the book. And you said it took off when it uh, won all of these uh, state literary awards which uh, they're all government funded and government sanctioned i mean they're called the premier's uh, literary L literary awards Absolutely. So, you, so you and i you and i are paying tim and your viewers are paying right so we're paying and for it all. Pay, paying paying to uh, we have paid to promote dark emu to make it the well sensation that it became Absolutely. Absolutely. So the ABC, he was he was on the. I just had a, a look. Uh, I think last week I had a check, but he's been on the ABC. I'm guessing maybe 10, 12 times from two thousand fourteen, two thousand fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, and he goes on shows like you know Virginia Trioli or uh, uh, Patricia Carvellis or the Book Show or whatever, and they have it or Jonathan Green, and they do interviews with him, and it's a way of it's the ABC is not meant to promote products, but to me it looks like they're promoting a book. And that's fair enough in a way, but it's it certainly helps a lot to get out there when you get promotion by the public uh, public broadcaster to broadcast book. Now, I first heard of the the dark emu controversy. It was uh, back then when, well, uh, Josephine Cashman, who at the time was on uh, Ken Wyatt, the Aboriginal Affairs Minister Senior Advisory Group for Planning the Indigenous Voice to, to, to Government, she uh, she went public to say that this uh, Bruce Pascoe's Dark Emu book is is not history. And she was when I saw her first on the the Bolt Report, she seemed mad as hell that how dare uh, my people's history be rewritten in this way and then taught uh, taught to, to to the younger people this uh, uh, this history which is not my people's history she 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 became quite i would say like she really uh, put forth the the because the, the, there are uh, Aboriginal activists outside of what we call the the super superstructure, uh, that's what we call it here at the the Unshackled, who who want to uh, to see real life the, the the real life welfare of especially those in remote Aboriginal communities uh, improve. And I think she really was able to communicate that it was sort of like a so, so the way I read it is like how dare he do this and mm. she blazed onto the, the the scene and that's when Andrew Bolt who's been he's been quite battered over the years in the in the in the history wars when it comes to Aboriginal issues including being taken to court uh, for a, a column uh, where he talked about the the mixed Aboriginal ancestry of uh, several Aboriginal uh, activists he's remained uh, uh, steadfast in his argument that the stolen generation, there was never a, a, a child who was taken uh, from a parent purely for, for racial reasons. So him willing to sort of enter this, be because it is a, a huge claim to make uh, about about an historical book that no, this is this is not this is not true, especially when it was a juggernaut. Yeah, so th there's two there's two aspects to this. There, there's the history, like Bruce Pascoe's book, right? So you can judge the book on its merits, right? He's right. It's to me, it's like um, you might some of your viewers will know Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Fire, right? So the he he said aliens came down and built the pyramids and everything, right? So it's enjoyable to read, but we all know it's rubbish, right? So 
that, that that's 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 the, the the side of Bruce Pascoe's book. The trouble is, there's a lot of well, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of Aboriginal people they know their history, right? And it, it's terribly derogatory to tell some people that they were something that they were not. Aboriginal people are very proud of being hunter gatherers, right? They're pro they're brilliant, you know. They're probably the, one of the best hunter gatherer societies in the world because. It's very hard to live in Australia. They've lived here for 50,000 years. It's the most in, inhospitable of continents. You and I, if we went, had to live here off the land, we'd probably last two weeks, right? So it's, it's a high, highly skilled, complex society that they had living as hunter-gatherers, and some people say hunter-gatherers fishers now or complex hunter-gatherers because, you know, they had fishing nets and they did have um, stone weirs to catch fish. They use poison to put in uh, water poles to, to kill fish and to kill emus. So it's pretty complex, right? But he's saying, no, no, we're going to pretend that you're um, uh, farmers, therefore you're, you're like us, you know, you're sophisticated, right? As if, as if hunter-gatherer people can't be sophisticated, right? You can actually be a sophisticated hunter-gatherer. You know, agriculture is a different thing. It's more complex in many ways, but it's complex to be a hunter-gatherer as well. So Josephine's saying that, and so... A lot of uh, Aboriginal people were deeply hurt because they're, they're saying that Bruce Pascoe is taking who we are from us, you know, and, and that's that's cultural appropriation. And so Abri uh, Bruce Pascoe thinks he could do it because he, he says he's Aboriginal, right? So Josephine was got, getting really upset with that, and not just Josephine, but lots of Aboriginal people. And we used to get a lot of emails from Aboriginal people saying, Roger, you've got to do something about this because... Many Aboriginal people are very gentle, um, uh, um, uh, polite people, and it's very bad form to contradict other Aboriginal people in public. But they would use, they would feed us information and say, "Look, Bruce Pascoe is wrong here. Here's some more information." And so people like me can go out and get our heads smashed in, right? And we can get away with it in a sense. We can often say things which Aboriginal people are thinking, but they're too polite to say. So that, that's the technical side. But then on the other side, and we didn't start this, but out of the blue, we, I've got, we, I work in a, like a network. I started by myself, but I found a lot of other people around Australia beavering away on this. And so I, in the end, I, I connected into them through uh, Facebook pages and whatever, and they, they all came up. So we ended up with about 20 or 30 people around Australia, all doing little bits and everything, finding information. And we got, we got access to people who are genealogists, right? And we were getting information that, oh, you know, maybe Bruce Pascoe is not as Aboriginal as, as he thinks. So we did a lot of work in that. And, you know, you've got to be careful what, what you say because um, – but basically we, we can't see from the evidence where Bruce Pascoe has Aboriginal ancestors, right? And, and Andrew Bolt has presented a lot of that. And Bruce Pascoe says he's got the paperwork, he's got the information to show he is Aboriginal, and he never presents it, right? That it's a very topic – bad subject when you have to when you talk about people's ancestry and everything it's very touchy right so technically bruce pascoe can call himself aboriginal i don't care no one really cares he can be he can believe he's aboriginal he can be accepted by aboriginal people and that's fine the warning bells go off in australia if you then put your hand out and say i want a benefit i want something because i'm indigenous because i'm aboriginal right and so we, we have what's called the three-part rule in Australia. So that you, you have to satisfy the government that the three parts, you've got to be identified as an Aboriginal yourself, you've got to be recognised by an Aboriginal society or group or family that you're Aboriginal, and you have to have some descent. Now, descent means, you know, one of your relatives, it doesn't matter how far back, has to be a known Aboriginal. That's the three-part rule. And that we have that. So if you go to the government and say, I want funding for an Indigenous Writers' Award, the government says, and should, it, that's that's the law, that, all right, you prove that you're Aboriginal, then you can go in the competition and get the funds. And a lot of people are saying that Bruce Pascoe doesn't satisfy that three-part rule, right? Now, I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other. I've just seen some information. And Bruce, Bruce has never, Mr Pascoe has never come out and said, here's the evidence. So what upset a, Josephine and a lot of other Aboriginal people is there's a lot of Aboriginal writers out there who are trying to get up the ladder and they see people who are collecting money, you know, tens of thousands in grants and prizes for Aboriginal, for being Aboriginal writers, and they're a bit suspicious. They don't, they don't think it's true, right? 
and 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 they don't they don't like it and it's not really fair if you're if you're going to put your hand out and get something because you're of your indigeneity you have to make everyone comfortable that you are indigenous right so it's not it, it's not for um us to prove that mr pascoe's indigenous it's for him to satisfy everyone else that he is indigenous and then the things come so that's where people like josephine and josephine stuck her neck out and she did all that and the powers that be all came down on her and made her life very hard, right? So I think she, I think Ken White got her off the board that she was on and whatever. Yeah, very so there's a, there's a lot of powerful forces in Australia. If you if you don't toe the line, things that can go against you, right? So that's 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 the issue, and we all have trouble with that. So I've, all the Aboriginal people I know, they they all agree that if you want to if you want to get something for because you're Indigenous, you have to satisfy the people giving you something that you are indigenous right and a lot of people say mr pascoe hasn't done that yet so that that's that's where that contributes first is all from so there's a historical side and then there's the indigeneity side right Indige it's very t it's always touchy to talk about people's history and their their um uh, ancestry right we shouldn't we shouldn't have to talk about it and we shouldn't we only need to talk about it when you put your hand out to get something from the taxpayer why it did well uh, first why did why do you think bruce pascoe felt the need to rewrite ancient uh, aboriginal australian history and but why the, the more important question why did the uh, established aboriginal activists the the superstructure as we call it why did they embrace his new history so much why was it so important to turn the history on its head to say no aboriginals were not hunter gatherers they were agriculturists if the, the way i interpreted trying to build up that uh, ancient aboriginal stray was some sort of ancient rome why was this new historical hmm. narrative why did they embrace it so much why well, what were they wanting to do there's two there's two uh, forces at play here. The, fir the first one is um, white Australian guilt. So the narrative has been cha changing over time. So that when I grew up, the narrative was that um, Aboriginal people were um, uh, um, had to be brought into our society. And we, we use the word assimilation. It's not a nice word. Now people say integration, right? So they had to be brought in. So on day one in 1788, they didn't get anything special, right? Because, you know, they couldn't speak English. You know, we, we'd, our cultures didn't understand. But over the 200 years, we've slowly improved all the time, such that I think the last one of the last big uh, change was 1967 when they were brought up to complete equality. And then we've had native title and whatever. So the whole idea of Australian society over 200 years is, and we might not have done it perfectly, but basically we've been going forward to bring up Aboriginal people to equality within Australia, right? And that was the narrative we're on. But in the last, um, since the 70s, 80s, the last 20, 30, 40 years, there's a political narrative where we're being made to feel guilty for what happened to original Aboriginal society because it did collapse, right? And that's, that's terribly sad, but that, that's, that's what happened. So to atone for our ills, for stealing the land and whatever, we, we have to feel guilty and give something back to Aboriginal. So there's a whole section of white society. Who, a lot of people bought this book and didn't read it. Right, so it was a moral statement. You went and bought it. You might have flicked through it, and then you put it on your coffee table. So when your friends in Fitzroy come around and see you, oh, you, you've got dark evil. You, you know, you're part of the um, part of the woke set. You know, you're you're atoning for our ills. It, it, it's like a it's like virtue signalling, right? There's there's that side of it, and that's one of the reasons why it's so popular. And even people like Stan Grant, he's written about it. He said. People, even though it's it's rubbish, he said white Australia believes it because they want to believe it, right? They want to they want to feel that oh, Aboriginal people were sophisticated. They did have democracy. They did live in villages. They weren't um, hunter gatherers, nomads, living a very materially simple life. Like Aboriginal people li lived a very had materially very simple, but they were highly complex in terms of kinship and family and in terms of religion and art. So they, they didn't put their effort in like we do. We put our effort into material things, you know, cars, planes, food, houses. They put their energy that they had every day, they got enough to eat, but then they put their energy into their art, their family, uh, their kinship, 
and their, their, their sort of spirituality, right? That's where they put their their effort, right? So there's those people doing that, but then and so that, so you can you don't I don't really feel that that bad, bad about um, middle class urbanites who want to who who want to atone for the sins of the past. I don't agree with it, but they they can do that. But then the other big group that mainly the political activists, right? There's a, there's a, this is what the Uluru Statement is about and the voice is about. It's not about to make life better for Aboriginal people in remote areas. It's, it's, it's a core group of Aboriginal activists. They actually want to get into the constitution. They actually want to make the seventh state of Australia, right? And they want an Aboriginal state. They want seats in the House of Representatives, seats in the Senate, and then in another 50 or so years, they want to go for sovereignty. They want to get a seat at the UN. They want Australia to split into two or more countries, uh, the old Australia and then Aboriginal states, right? Now, they've been trying to manoeuvre around that, but the trouble is legally, Australia is 100% legally correct, right? So it was, it was, it was a settlement. It wasn't a conquest. They, the activists try and make it look like an invasion and everything, but it was a, it was a settlement. The world recognises Australia as a settled colony, right? It's a, it was formed as a federation on, in 1901, the Commonwealth of Australia. So legally for the last 30 years, Aboriginal people have been trying to attack uh, the, the the core foundation of Australia, and they haven't been able to get away with it. They haven't been able to change legal anything legal. So what they want to do now is change the young voters. They they're working on this generation of kids who become the voters next in the next uh, thirty years. They want us to think that we stole the land illegally from Aboriginal people because Aboriginal people were really farmers. If they had have been farmers, we should have signed a treaty. So they actually had sovereignty. They worked the soil. So mentally, the activists are trying to use they they use my in my opinion they're using dark emu as a, as like a wedge to show that the British made a mistake. They should have realised it was uh, uh, so Aboriginals had sovereignty here. Therefore, we have to give sovereignty back. We got to sign treaties, and that's what's happening now. We're getting treaty processes all around Australia. So they've, they've suffered a bit of a knockback because Bruce Pascoe was their main barrier ram, uh, battering ram, and now he's fallen in a heap. So hopefully that's made the whole process a bit harder for them, right? So that's where the push was coming from. That's why it was popular. That's why there's a hardcore activist who are pushing it on the ABC. They're pushing it in universities. They're pushing it in Canberra. They're pushing it through, like Marsha Langton, you know, she's on the um, the voice committee and she stood up. She's an anthropologist and said, yep, Bruce Pascoe is right. She's pushing it because, in my opinion, politically, it's it helps her political cause to show that the British dispossessed the Aborigines who were really farmers and we made a mistake, so we've got to give it back to them. That's the theory. It definitely sounds to me that by uh, putting forward the, the narrative that ancient Aboriginal Australia was this sophisticated agricultural society, that to to re really up the the white guilt, like wow, like you, like the the, the European settlers destroyed a a, a well sophisticated uh, ancient uh, society, so it's, so mm -hmm. to to build up the that uh, Australia was invaded. That's that's certainly yeah. what it seems to be, and uh, that certainly is is yeah. is how you see it as well. Uh, but uh, it's yeah, we going to the what is it the what is it, historical reconciliation process, which well, we're now at the the stage now with the 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 Uluru statement from fr from the heart. These the the these activists they've they've always never been satisfied like uh, the, the 1967 no. referendum to uh, to remove the the part of the constitution that excluded aborigines from the the census after that we had what is it native title then there was uh, uh, saying sorry to the the stolen generations and the mm -hmm. recognizing uh, ancient aboriginal uh, Australia in the the Constitution, people might not remember, was actually a election proposal by John Howard in in two thousand and seven, and then it was it's it's been bubbling along since. Uh, not much happened during the Rudd Gillard years, and not much has happened through the the Abbott Turnbull uh, Morrison years because well they they know that they have to 
ha have to make sure that if there is a referendum that uh, it's successful because only eight out of 43 Australian referendums have been uh, successful. But uh, of course, the, the the Aboriginal activists, as soon as this uh, the, this referendum proposal had gained, gained more traction, the, the recognise campaign that the AFL, Qantas supporters, like, hey, let's, uh, we've already got enough support for that. And that's when they, they went for the Uluru Statement uh, from the heart to have a voice parliament, which is, well, they're trying to get more sovereignty of their, of their, of their own. Yeah, that, that's right. So it's it's <clears throat> that that's the political side, right? So that that that's how that's coming. But I think you'll find that's it's in the whole world now. It's it's the whole concept before was was there, there was inequality in the world, right? So um, minority groups were often oppressed, disadvantaged, and our society has has come to recognise that over you know pretty much over the last 50, 70 years, and we've brought all those minority groups up and that, that you know that's homosexual it's um, lesbians it's gay guys it's um, um, aboriginal people it's uh, migrants right so the whole idea is to bring those people up to equality with what we call mainstream australia the trouble is there's a certain number of activists in there they want to go beyond equality so so what's what within this particular case so in terms of the voice what that actually means is that aboriginal people will get two votes so They'll vote for their local member, like you and me, but then they'll have a separate stream of democracy where they vote for their own people who then get into parliament and get a get a, get a a second bite of the cherry on legislation that's going through. So Aboriginal people want to go beyond, well, not, not all Aboriginal, but act, Aboriginal activists want to go beyond that. They want extra things, right? And you sometimes see that, you'll see that in, you know, the gender wars, you know, that we, women have been fighting for equality you know, all those years, they're finally getting equality, but now there are men coming in as, as um, trans trans men, trans women, whatever, coming to hijack the thing and actually overtaking where women were and trying to push women back. So it, it's, a, it's a worldwide, uh, like a woke problem, it's a worldwide thing, right? So, but in this particular case, that, that that's what, what, what that angle is. Um, so just to go back a bit on the um, stealing Aboriginal um, uh, authenticity, that's where this new book, this, these academics, these are the ones that really... So, so people like me and Andrew Bolt, we can bang on and we'll appeal to... Now, a certain Peter O'Brien, because yeah, his book was published by Quadrant uh, Books, which yeah. is... Uh, Quadrant, right? Uh, so, right. In so the he, he was the first... Yeah, he was the first one. But because he's from Quadrant, we all, you know, they get a bad press, right? So when you get two left-wing academics come out against it and they're from Melbourne University Publishing, right, that's when it really, the whole thing caved in for Bruce Pascoe. So the whole dark emu thing was coming along and it was, it was struggling because we were holding it back a bit. But the fatal blow was when the left-wing academics came out and said what Bruce is saying in there is totally wrong, right? And that, that's what killed it for him, right? And that, that's where... Um, that's pretty much, I think we're going to, we think it's going to be the fatal blow, right? So despite, even though they're only saying what we were saying, but because we're from the centre right, you know, um, the, the left people, the centre left people won't believe us. But someone from the left is saying it now. It's in the, it's in the, the age, it's in uh, Crikey magazine, uh, Crikey online. So now it's pretty much, um, uh, there's a whole lot of uh, people that have come out as critics of, Bruce Pascoe, from the left to the centre to the right, and that's why that'll end, right? So that's why it's a big political blow to the Uluru Statement and the voice and that whole momentum. So you, you might have noticed it's all sort of dying a bit dead in the water, like the voice and the Uluru Statement. It was really a hot topic, what, two years ago, whatever, uh, but it's all really slowed down because everyone has worked out the, the, the sort of the political machinations that have been going on and they realise it's not in the best interest of the country. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a good deal for Australians. But in the, the, the aftermath of, the, of the, the Melbourne University publishing uh, book, you, you still had uh, uh, Ken Wyatt at the, the federal level and uh, well, the, the New South Wales Premier Glasgow Jicklin was, was asked, well, given uh, the, 
it, we there is this uh, growing evidence that uh, dark emu is is just not true. You're still going to teach it as historical fact in in schools. And I think what is it, Gladys Berejiklian said that uh, oh, it's it's good to have these sorts of uh, debates about uh, history because of course politicians they they never like to admit uh, they've uh, they they they've been they're wrong or they've been hoodwinked and they, they never like uh, sorry is the hardest word for a politician or a uh, to admit that they they got it wrong we're seeing that uh, that quite a bit now so they're still in the uh, in the the government education uh, departments doesn't matter if it's uh, liberal li liberal or labor at a at a state or, or federal level the 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 education departments in particular have still got this uh, are still teaching it in school st schools as a yeah. historical fact yeah see the, the part of the problem with our society i think i think there aren't courageous people anymore i mean there, there must be some but we're not as courageous as we used to be right so what happens is i think um mark latham um put a motion to the parliament in new south wales to have young dark emu or dark emu taken out of schools right because he's saying, you know, you, you don't, you don't, you, it's false history, right? So, for example, if you're teaching the Holocaust, you don't let whatever his name is, David Irvine, come in and have his book, right, uh, on such a, a sensitive topic as that because, you know, there's history and there's history, right? You don't have every alternative view. We're, we're paying millions of dollars for historians, for academics and everything to do their job to say what's right. So he put up a proposal to remove it. And I think, I think from memory, only five people voted for it. Him, Fred Nile, and I think uh, two of the three shooters, Fishers and Shooters Party, the Liberal Party and the Labor Party voted against his motion to take it out of schools. And my feeling is, so you said Gladys just said, you know, we need it in schools. I have a feeling it's because she's got a million things on her mind, right? This, this is probably not the highest priority. And they're scared of social media if she had to come out and say something because they everyone wants to be a virtual signal so a, pub, a politician comes out and wants to get through the day without getting on twitter getting being abused having facebook go against him or saying anything controversial so it's safer for her to not stand up for the rights of school children it's easy for her to say oh well we'll just you know we need these views and let someone else worry about it this, and this this is a big problem. No one's got principles anymore, right? And so that, that's what happens. And if you let this get in the schools, well, then other, other crap will get in, right? And the thing is, it's no, it's, not a, it's no coincidence that Australian children are falling down. I think I read the other day um, where, you know, so many years behind, our kids are so many years behind where they were 10 years ago. Um, because we're not teaching them properly. We, we, we're not being rigorous. We're, we're letting all this mumbo jumbo come in. Now, it might not be necessarily teachers' fault. You know, they're under a lot of pressure, but, you know, teachers have to carry some of the blame, but so do parents. You know, if I was a parent, I would be going to my school and say, look, if you've got this rubbish in your school, I don't want my kids reading this, right? So if you, if you have a look at this, right, this is young, dark emu, right? If you look at the first couple of pages, right, you get in here, so the, the, the headings are like, you know, um, this is for seven and eight-year-olds, Gra grab for the land. Huh? What? One, sorry. One, la one the land grab, right? So the land grab. Then you've got pictures of, um, um, what else have they got? Oh, I can't find it. But you've got, oh, here it's there. So pictures of people shooting each other, right? They're a bit hard to see. But there's massacres, yeah. right? So you can't, you can't be a seven or your eight-year-old children and get taught that your ancestors massacred Aboriginal people. Kids like that can't say, compete that. And that's another, that, uh, another uh, disputed uh, area of what you'd say European settlement yeah. history, the, the frontier wars. There's also been uh, a lot of literature published uh, disputing a lot of the uh, uh, alleged uh, uh, white settler massacres of uh, Aboriginal uh, Australians going going back to what is a uh, quadrant uh, its uh, editor Keith Winshuttle has, has published a, a number of books on the uh, well, volumes of the, the fabrication of uh, Aboriginal history yeah. yeah that's right so what it is um, 
uh, there were lots of skirm. A lot of people say uh, what, the the, the, um, the the narrative being pushed now was it was a frontier war. There were massacres here, massacres there. Um, uh, we were brutal. Um, it should be a war. It wasn't peacefully settled. Whereas, what other hist or traditionally historians say, and Keith Winchuttle still says it, that basically, sure, there were skirmishes, there were clashes, there were there were fights between Aboriginal people and settlers. But in the scheme of things, in terms of the world, right, it wasn't a particularly violent um, settlement, right? So not, not like uh, North America or parts of Africa or South America. So, and the thing is, uh, it wasn't state sanctioned. So if you, if you, um, there were lots of cases where convicts and settlers were hung for killing Aboriginal people because it was illegal, because Aboriginal people were um, British subjects. So you, you, it was illegal to kill them. It was, it was illegal for them to kill you, right? So legally, um, so it's like Australia now. Australia is not, none of us would say Australia is a murderous country. But every day there's a murder here. doesn't mean the country's murderous. It's illegal and whatever, and we try and stop it, and we do the best we can. And in colonial times, the government tried that. It tried the best it can to control it, not as effective as it should have been. And there was some appalling massacres and killings. But it's not it's not state sanctions. It's not genocide. It's it's not it's not a holocaust, right? Um, and then you've got to look at the numbers. So um, people like Henry Reynolds say maybe twenty thousand Aboriginal people were killed, and that's appalling. But in the scheme of things, out of a population of three hundred thousand, and some people say there's seven hundred thousand, um, and you're having fighting on some of the frontiers right out in the bush, it's not a lot of people, right? And, and the thing is, and other people say, well, where's the evidence, right? So there's, there's the documentary evidence. I think um, the University of Newcastle's up to about 6,000 people. They uh, 6,000 Aboriginals were killed from the literature. But no one really finds any bones. No one finds massacre sites. No one finds um, bullet hole wounds in bones. So it's not, we're not saying it didn't happen, but we're just saying maybe the scale of things wasn't as bad as the, the activists want us to believe, right? Because what they want to do, they want to get yeah. guilt. They want to get guilt into us to be responsible for something that happened 200 years ago, 100 years ago, right? And so it's a political narrative. It's not a factual narrative, right? And the thing is, as a country, if we say, look, we fixed it all, we're not doing it again, that's the, hope, that's the best we can hope for. We, can, we can't be held responsible for what happened hundreds of years ago, but we can be held, if we, can, if we still did it, we, we should be condemned, but we don't still do it. And I remember when uh, the the Aboriginal activists uh, attempted to import uh, what I call BLM 2.0 into Australia last year after the, uh, the death of, of George Floyd. Uh, they got very upset when Scott Morrison said, well, Australia uh, doesn't have a history of uh, uh, slavery against uh, Aboriginal Australians. And then they started to promote it promote uh, this, uh, that that uh, Australia had this uh, widespread practice of, of blackbirding, which is not technically slavery, but it's still uh, forced labour. So they tried to, to, to make that into a thing. Oh, we still had a form of uh, racist slavery in Australia. Yeah. Yeah, so what it is, and Bruce Pascoe, he, he comes out, he said, oh, you know, with slavery because Aboriginal people were put in chains or whatever, right? But I, you've got to understand, there's a bit of history here, and, and this is this is why we get upset that the historians don't promote the good things. So um, uh, um, Cap, um, uh, Arthur Phillip, who um, the first governor of Australia, he actually wrote some papers, I think in 1785 or something, before Wilberforce. Wilberforce was the guy in England who actually abolished or promoted the, um, the work to abolish slavery. So Phillip... Um, Governor Phillip was, was writing about there will be no slavery when he comes to Australia. He came to Australia and said, there's no way known there's ever going to be slavery here. And I think I'm right in saying Australia is the only continent, the only country that's never had slavery. And so slavery, what happens is the, 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 the postmodernists, the activists, they, they, they use word creep. They change the meaning of words that we have. So slavery to us, most of us, means what's called chattel slavery, where you can buy a person in a marketplace, they become your property. When they have children, the children of that slave become yours. So that's classic Southern American plantation slavery, right? That, that, that's what slavery is. Whereas Bruce Pascoe said, oh, we had slavery in Australia because 
we had um, the Kanakas, who were like the um, the Nevans, the Vanuatu people coming from to work in the sugar cane, right? And they they were originally there was there was a few cases of blackbirding where they they um, kidnapped um, Solomon Islanders and Vanuatuans and brought them to work in the sugar cane. But the Queensland government was dead against it. And they kept fighting it um, legally. So only a small number came, and then so then the then the sugar um, growers started using what was called indentured labour. So they would go to Vanuatu or the Solomons and say, "Here's a contract. We will pay you. I think it's three pound a year. You would come on a contract for two or three years, and then you would go back." Right now, if it was that bad, you would expect that all the people that came here were so bad they would go to Vanuatu and they would never come back. There's heaps of cases where people signed up two or three times. So if it's slavery, would you re-sign? And we've got photographs. We're going to do a blog post on it. But they, they're on the boat coming here. There's some which are just as, just as natives. But others have got hats on, clothes on. They love coming to Australia, working, and then going back to their village with all their goods and their money, and they were heroes. So they, they were the four, visa four, four, five, seven visa people of their day. And we're doing it now. We've got Samoans. We've got people coming here on visas and working for six months and then going back to Fiji and Vanuatu. And they whinge and moan. They're not getting paid enough, but they're still doing it. It's a payment. So there, there, that's, there wasn't no real slavery like that. We never had slave markets. And the only case in Australia where someone was sold was, I think it was 1811, uh, a settler sold his wife in Sydney, white guy, right? So he sold his wife and she wanted to be sold. So she, he put her up on a block, sold her for a pound. The, um, the uh, governor found out about it. They chased them down. They put them in chains, right, and they fined them because they weren't allowed to do that. So in, in, the, in the colonial times in England especially, people sometimes sold their wives, right, to make a bit of extra money. So the only, that's the only case we could find of actually someone selling someone in Australia, right? And even today, there's a bit of slavery. Last week, two Indian people went to jail for, I think, eight years or 10 years for keeping a slave in their suburban home in Melbourne, right? That doesn't mean we're a slave economy, right? So in 100 years' time, people aren't going to come back and say, oh, Melbourne had slaves in 2021. Yeah, there was a slave, but it was illegal, and the government jumped on it. And it's the same as the Kanakas. We never enslaved Aboriginal people. Um, there were pe every people in chains as convicts, you know, prisoners working, just like there were convicts in chains. It doesn't look good, but they weren't slaves. So it's all it's all rubbish. It's all just manipulating our history to push a political, uh, to make us feel bad, to make our children feel bad, to destroy the, the confidence of our children in our country. So people want to destroy our society. So that's why you have to stand up to it and just say, no, it's all rubbish. Uh, so where do you see Dark Emu and uh, Bruce Pascoe going in the, the medium-term future? Because obviously with what's going on in the country at the, the moment, uh, there's other uh, issues which are dominating the news cycles. Uh, but when the, the, the curve goes flat again, that's when these cultural issues uh, come up again. I mentioned BLM 2.0 uh, middle of last year then we had what is that me too 2.0 in australia in around about uh, march and then we had i think another kids kids climate strike as well so uh, the oh, reconciliation what it whatever you want to call it uh, uh voice to voice to parliament uluru statement it will come back again and it could be that uh, the 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 left cultural left they they just cut their losses and say let's just pretend Bruce Pascoe never existed we'll we'll just move on or uh, uh, he could uh, live on like Elizabeth Warren uh, did over in the U.S. when she for her entire political career claimed to be Cherokee. Native American and then decided she would take a, a DNA test which didn't work out. Yeah. 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 So, so what will happen is, uh, <laughs> um, uh, in my opinion, Bruce Pascoe will live on. Bruce, Bruce is, well, Mr. Pascoe is a very good yarner. He's a good talker. He likes to spin a yarn. He likes to, uh, he likes, um, you know, he, he enjoys being a writer, right? So what's happened over the last uh, four, five, six months is a lot of Aboriginal 
uh, people are, are disappearing from Bruce, right? So they're, they're, they're pulling out. They don't want to be associated with it. Uh, a lot of the ABC, you know, the, the, um, the more um, uh, senior ones are, are not associating with him anymore. But what's happening is uh, Pascoe's always gone to things like permaculture um, conferences, um, uh, greenies. He's moving into, into with the Gaians now and sustainability crowd. Right? So it's all this Mother Earth. So what he's starting to do now, he's trying to, to link his, his um, theories about using um, uh, Indigenous plants to care for Mother Earth. And so he's being drawn into that green sustainability uh, climate action, anti-capitalist, gay and area, right? Good on him. I don't care. I mean, that's fine. But that, that's that's where uh, Pasco and his dark envy will end up going. That a lot of the followers are, are quite happy with that. They're actually not. They don't really care about the Aboriginal side, but they want. They want. They want. They like the indigeneity of it. Um, they like the uh, the the soft footprint, right? uh no fossil fuels we're all gonna hug trees hold hands it's that sort of soft thing that's where he's going now so you watch over the next six or 12 months so the the political side with the voice and the will keep going over here but just i don't think bruce will be in the in the and bruce will be over here with the guyans the sustainability people the permaculture people um the tree huggers that sort of thing that's where he's going i think so he'll reinvent himself in uh, in that field. I think so because that I mean, and that that's that's he's good at that, right? He speaks very well. Um, uh, his audience like him, right? He's done another book with a photographer where they've gone around Australia and taken photos, right? They're more into the 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 mother earth, and that's where the publishing world's going, right? There's a huge explosion on um, climate books, but you know. Um, uh, natural plants, uh, Mother Earth, Earth, sustainability, that sort of stuff, and trying to get indigeneity into the school curriculum. You know, it's all this kumbaya stuff. So that's where he, he's got another 10 years there, I think. So he'll do all right. Well, I appreciate you coming on tonight, Roger, to explain thoroughly the uh, Bruce Pascoe dark emu phenomena, the, the rise and fall, and I'm sure uh, that uh, you'll be still continue to be uh, ever ever vigilant uh, at your, your website, which uh, for everybody, it's dark-emu-exposed.org. Uh, so there's a dash between each of the, the words dark-emu-exposed.org. All right. Thanks very much for having me on. It's been interesting to talk. And um, all I want to say is, though, like I'm actually a nobody, but I'm really, it's, it's amazing what you can do in the modern world. If you've, as long as you're talking about the truth, right? If I was trying to talk rubbish or anything, it wouldn't get anywhere. But because we, we're doing the truth, we're using facts and everything, it's amazing what you can get done. So years ago, we probably wouldn't have been able to to bring down Dark Emu. We would have written our letters to the letter of the editors and all would have been ignored. But in the modern world, if, you, if you're following a, a just cause and it's what you're doing is truthful and you put the facts out there, it's amazing what you can do. So it's good. So thanks for that. You should be very proud of yourself. You're the, 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 the perfect definition of a of a quiet uh, achiever sure there, there there's the the vocal people as i said uh, andrew bolt josephine cashman there's also obviously warren mundine and uh jacinta price who hopefully will be in the in the in the in the senate but you've been diligent uh, behind the scenes well got the ball rolling uh, originally which is the most uh, critical thing so well done on that yeah yeah, me and about twenty or thirty other normal, quiet Australians, right? So, I think I think that's the best thing uh, uh, Morrison's ever done. Come up with the term "quiet Australian" because it actually it actually hits the spot. You know, a lot of us are quiet, but um, but I think we're we're going to start to roar a bit more, right? Get out there and do things like with you with your program, right? And it's amazing what can happen as long as everyone talks and builds on each what everyone else is doing. Um, you can you can you can affect public policy. I think that's good. All right, thanks. Yes, it's, it's all it's it's all worthwhile uh, as as your story shows. Take care, Roger. Thanks very much. Bye.
Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.